We spoke about last time about the general concept of reward and punishment. We proved that the Almighty indeed dispenses reward and punishment. If someone has a mitzvah, if someone adheres to the will of God, they will be the recipients of reward. If someone transgresses the will of God, they will be recipients of divine punishment. Of course, we talked about the ideal. In an idealized world, we should be motivated for altruistic reasons through mitzvahs. We should try the mitzvahs not necessarily because of the reward, and we should avoid transgressions not to avoid punishment. But of course, that's a very high level. And beginners should, we're told, in fact, be motivated by reward and punishment. And we spoke briefly about the concept of the afterlife, how it is the venue of reward and punishment in most cases. Today, I want to get down to the specifics and to broaden our discussion about the systems and the nature and the unique characteristics of divine reward and punishment. The concept of reward and punishment exists in our world. You know, humans, we reward good behavior and we punish bad behavior. But I want to focus now specifically on what we know about how the Almighty dispenses reward and punishment because we will discover that it is in fact different than the way we do it here. So let's begin. The first idea is based upon a verse in Devarim, chapter 32. This is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. This is part of the Song of Ha'azinu. And it tells us that God is fair and just and precise in judgment. The way he doles out reward and punishment is with precision and with justice. Hatsur tamim pa'alo, the rock, his deeds are perfect. Ki chold rochav mishpat, all his ways are just. Elu he's a faithful God, a trustworthy God, and there's no iniquity, there's no corruption. Tzadik v'yashar hu, he is true, he is righteous, he is upstanding. What does this mean? So Rashi tells us a bunch of interesting aspects of divine reward and punishment. So first of all, he tells us, Hatsur tamim pa'alo, God is a, like a rock, it's the name of God, but his deeds are perfect. What that means is, even though the Almighty is omnipotent, even though the Almighty is all-powerful, nevertheless, when he meets out punishment upon the wicked, he doesn't come at them with a flood. He doesn't pummel them in punishment. Rather, he does what's proper. His deeds are perfect. Okay, that's the first idea. And then he says the second idea. And this idea is going to upend our basic understanding of how reward and punishment is, in fact, dispensed. And there's a few moving parts here, so you have to listen carefully. El Emuna, a trustworthy God. What does that mean? Says Rashi. God is trustworthy? Lishalim litzadikim, to pay the tzadikim, the righteous, tzidkasim, their merits, their righteousness, le'olmaba, in olmaba, in the afterlife. So God is trustworthy to reward the righteous for their righteousness in olmaba. And even though he's going to delay his payment, you know, you do a mitzvah here, and then you live till 150, you have to wait 150 years at a minimum. We don't know exactly the timeline of Olam Abba. We'll talk more about that at great length down the line. But your whole life, you don't get any reward. The money is not paying you on time. Nevertheless, you could trust God. He'll pay you for your righteousness, for the righteous people in Olam Abba. In the end, the money will deliver. The ain of and there is no iniquity. What does it mean that God's treatment of us is fair? There's no iniquity. Afle Rishayim. The Almighty will also reward the wicked. He will pay their reward for their righteousness, whatever righteousness a wicked person has. The Olam Hazeh in this world. So the Almighty is trustworthy. He'll pay the righteous for the righteousness in the world to come, and He will also pay the wicked people who are generally wicked, but also have a few mitzvahs, he will pay their righteousness in this world. 
concludes the verse, Tzadik v'yashar, who God is righteous and upstanding, everyone justifies the judgment of God. So Rashi tells us something very interesting. God is just. God is fair. God is righteous in dispensing reward and punishment. So that's the general idea of the verse. And that the righteous, they're going to have the reward delayed until the afterlife. And the wicked, they're going to get their reward for their comparatively few mitzvos in this world. And everyone accepts his judgment as righteous. Now this Rashi is actually a citation from the Talmud in the book of Hannes, page 11a. And this is a very interesting and instructive piece on how God dispenses reward and punishment. And it's going to unlock for us many of the unique aspects of divine reward and punishment. It gives us a little bit more context. It tells us God is a trustworthy God. Just as the Almighty will punish the wicked in Olam Abba, even for a small transgression, so too the Almighty will punish the righteous in this world, even for a small transgression. And just as the Almighty will reward the righteous in Olam Abba, even for a small mitzvah, so too the Almighty will reward the wicked in this world, even for a small mitzvah. So if we unpack this Talmud, we discover some very important ideas. So first of all, first important idea. A person's general righteousness does not overshadow all the preponderance of deeds that they do. Meaning, a righteous person, someone's righteous person in general, they don't have blanket immunity for the few sins that they actually did. See, a righteous person, they did a few sins, those sins must be punished for, provided the person doesn't repent. Conversely, if you have a wicked person, God does not ignore the few measly, meager, paltry mitzvahs that the wicked person does. Every mitzvah, no matter how big or small, and no matter the relative righteousness of the person who does it, that mitzvah engenders reward, similarly with transgressions. No mitzvah is too small to be negligible. No sin is too small to be ignored. So that's idea number one. Righteousness of the individual does not overshadow all their deeds, and there are different sizes of mitzvahs relative to how much reward they get, similarly with sin, and all that's accounted for. But the big bombshell of this Talmud is that the venue of reward and punishment is different for the righteous and the wicked. The righteous are punished here for their few sins, and rewarded in Olam Abba, in the future, down the line, for their many mitzvos. And the wicked get the opposite treatment. They are rewarded here for their few mitzvos, and they are punished in Olam Abba for their many sins. So when we say that there's no ultimate reward for mitzvos in this world, we have to be much more nuanced about it. Excuse me. That is referring only to the righteous who have their reward saved for Olam Abba. For, their, for the wicked, they in fact get their reward here. So let's explain what this is actually telling us. Ultimate reward and ultimate punishment is indeed reserved for Olam Abba. But depending upon the righteousness of the individual, that will determine if they are a recipient of ultimate reward or of ultimate punishment. Every person, they have their ultimate state, and then they have the incidental things that they do out of character. A righteous person, their ultimate state is one of reward, 
which was ultimately kind of an, an aggregate, they're a righteous person. They have some in incidental sins. And all incidentals are dealt with here. For the righteous, the incidentals, well, that's the sins. And that is dealt over here. For the wicked, their ultimate standing is one of being wicked. And what's incidental are those mitzvos. And again, incidentals are dealt with here. So we could still say that ultimate reward and punishment is dispensed in Olam Abba, but a person who is righteous in general, their ultimate destiny is that of reward, and therefore they get the reward on Abba. A person who is generally wicked, their ultimate destiny is punishment, because they're ultimately a wicked person, and therefore that too is reserved for Olam Abba. Olam Abba is the place, the world to come, the afterlife, is a place where the, a person's ultimate standing is determined and here, in this world, that is where we address the incidentals. The mitzvos of the wicked, those incidental few mitzvos that they did, addressed here. The few sins of the righteous, those incidentals, are addressed here. Incidentals are dealt with in this world. The ultimate venue of reward and punishment is, in fact, the afterlife. Now, this brings us to another critical point, which I like to call the Almighty's pro-choice stance. I'm trying to get everyone's attention here. Listen to this. We know that reward in Olam Abba greatly exceeds reward in this world. How do you know that? Because it says so explicitly. The Mishnah tells us in the fourth chapter of Pirtiabos, it's better to have one hour of pleasure in the afterlife. That is greater than all the life of this world. Reward in the afterlife dwarfs reward in this world. And therefore, we have a problem. Because the verse, the verse is touting the Almighty's fairness. He is a trustworthy God. He is a fair God. There's no iniquity. He's righteous. He's upstanding. Yet when the Talmud explains the system here, it's describing a very unfair, a very inequitable system. Why? You have a righteous person, does a mitzvah. You have a wicked person, does the identical mitzvah. Because for the righteous person, that's part of their ultimate destiny, that is reward in Olam Abba. And because this is part of the incidental behavior of the wicked person, it's rewarded here. So you have a system where two identical mitzvahs are done, and one of them receives reward in the ultimate venue of reward, and that's much greater than the wicked person who receives reward in this world on a much lower level. And yet the Talmud says that this is the interpretation of the verse that says God is fair. And the answer is that God is pro-choice. The Almighty says, you did a mitzvah, you will get reward. And not only will I give you reward, I will let you choose which part of your existence is primary and which part of your existence do you want to have the reward paid out to you. Not only will the Almighty reward good deeds, the Almighty gives you the choice. Which world do you want to be paid in? What currency do you want to be paid in? Do you want it in this world? Or do you want it in Olam Abba? A righteous is someone who implicitly says, I favor my soul over my body. I favor my spiritual half over my physical half. That's the definition of a righteous person. And therefore, that person, the righteous person, is implicitly requesting from God, reward me in the afterlife. A wicked person, by definition, is someone who prioritizes the physical, the transient nature of a body, and therefore is making a request from God, please reward me here. And God's pro-choice. God says, okay, you want the reward in Olamaba? I'll reserve it for Olamaba. You want the reward here? I'll give it to you here. It's up to you. You make a choice which half of your existence you want to make primary 
and which half you want to be only incidental. It's super duper fear. Not only will the Almighty reward the wicked for every miss they do, the Almighty will also let the wicked choose to be paid here. Which is, by the way, why it's very important or it's very beneficial to not choose to cash out early because then you are going to be exhausting your reward for all my bum. If you say, God, pay me in pesos, I says, okay, is that what you want? I'll pay you in pesos. Or you could say, pay me in kilos of gold in the afterlife. And by the way, this is a tangent here, Abraham and, and Jacob, they're both terrified that they have exhausted all their reward over here. Chapter 15, God has, chapter 15 of Genesis, that is, God has to reassure Abraham, don't worry, your reward is reserved for the afterlife. When Jacob is about to reunite with his brother Esau, he's worried that he has become small, he has been diminished by all the goods they might did for him in this world. We see a pattern that the righteous are very wary of receiving any reward here because it might, because it, because it may detract from their reward in the afterlife. But that's, again, an idea. This is a foundational idea of how they might dispense reward and punishment. Everything's accounted for. And a person gets to choose their primary identity and the area in which they want to receive reward. There's another point over here. We're told that there's a big mitzvah and then there's a small mitzvah. The righteous are rewarded for the small mitzvah in Olam The wicked is rewarded for the small mitzvah here. There is size relative to reward in mitzvahs and in sin. So size exists and size matters, both in mitzvahs and how much reward they engender, and in transgressions and how much punishment they beget. What determines the size, the robustness, of a mitzvah that gets a big fat reward and what determines the size and robustness of a sin? The answer is found in a very short Mishnah in the end of the fifth chapter of Pertiavos. Lefum tsara agra. To the degree of pain is the degree of reward. The more difficult it is for a person to do something, the greater the reward that they earn for that thing meaning this is completely individualized. For one person, doing a mitzvah, a given mitzvah, is relatively easy, and therefore the reward is relatively small. For a different person, the identical mitzvah may be very difficult, and therefore the reward that that gets is much bigger. And there could be two different people doing the identical mitzvah. There could be also one person doing the, doing, doing the identical mitzvah at a different time. When you're not in the mood, for example, you're not in the mood to do a mitzvah. Oh, it's a bad day. You're in a terrible mood. Yesterday, you were on fire. Yesterday, you were just firing on all cylinders. You were in a gray mood. It was really easy for you to do the mitzvah. Today, you're down. You're depressed. You're not in the mood. You're all cynical. And you do the mitzvah nonetheless. It was much harder for you to do it today. And therefore, the reward for today's mitzvah is much greater. And by the way, this is orders of magnitude larger. Our sages tell us one mitzvah done in pain exceeds a hundred mitzvahs done when it was easy. And that number might in fact be all the way up to 10,000, a hundred times a hundred. You could have a person doing one mitzvah and it's super easy. They get one unit of credit, one unit of reward. If it's super duper hard, that identical mitzvah may yield 10,000 units of reward. And again, everything's taken into account to determine how difficult it is, who the person is, what kind of mood they're in, what's the situation, what's their background, what are the circumstances and the situations of the particular opportunity to a mitzvah. So, give an example. For me, it's really easy to keep Shabbos. Totally easy. 
Why? I've done it my whole life. I always say I'm brainwashed. I've been brainwashed. I've been indoctrinated. I've been drinking the Kool-Aid intravenously my whole life. So to me that this is so easy. Someone who's never kept Shabbos in their life. It's, it's so difficult to do it. Because they're not used to it. They don't have the, the communal framework to keep, to, to, to make it possible, to make it easy to do. They're not used to it. They're not anticipating it. For them, it's really hard. I would imagine that the reward that someone like that gets for keeping one Shabbos exceeds the reward that I get for keeping 100 Shabbos, maybe even more. For me, it's easy. The reward is really small. For them, it's hard. And to the degree of difficulty is the degree of reward. And by the way, conversely, the opposite would in fact be true. For someone like me, I have the background, thank God. If I were, God forbid, to violate the Shabbos, of course, that would be a huge unconscionable sin, but it would be way worse because it was so easy for you to do it, yet you did not maintain it. So for someone like me to violate Shabbos would be way worse than for someone who doesn't have that same background. Now, again, anyone who violates the Shabbos, Torah says, it's part of the Ten Commandments. Torah says that it's very severe. But nevertheless, for someone who it's easier to do it, that corresponding sin, should someone, God forbid, violate the Shabbos, would be that much worse. So there's variability in the difficulty of doing a mitzvah and conversely in doing a sin, and therefore there is variability in the reward and the punishment. The Talmud tells us, we've spoken about this in the past, there was a rabbi who had a near-death experience. And when he came to, when he was resuscitated, they asked him, what do you see? And he said, I saw an upside-down world, a topsy-turvy world. The lofty ones are lowly, and the lowly ones are lofty. And they said to him, no, no, you didn't see an upside-down world. You saw a clear world. Our world is upside-down. There is a fundamental difference between how our world accords honor and accords reward and punishment versus how God does it. We don't have the tools to properly judge people. We don't know what a person's background is. We don't know what their history is. We don't know what their challenges are. We don't know what their yetzara is. We can only look at the results. We can only judge in absolute terms. We're not able to see all the nuances that go into determining a person in the background and their kind of challenges. And therefore, if there's someone, let's say, who was granted all the gifts and they accomplished a lot, but they did only 50% of what they could have accomplished, they are not, in God's eyes, as lofty as someone who did a third, a tenth, a hundredth on an absolute scale of what they did, but someone who maximized their potential. If you do 100% of what you can do, even if in absolute terms that's a hundredth of what someone else does, you are completely righteous. Because God judges everyone as an individual relative to their unique circumstance. No one is expected to do more than they can in fact do, and no one is let off the hook for what they could have done. So effort matters, and therefore the degree of difficulty, that's going to determine the value of a mitzvah. How much did it hurt you to do it? How much effort and devotion and dedication did you expend? And therefore, listen to this. What about when someone tries to do a mitzvah? They try really, really hard to do a mitzvah. But something external torpedoes it. You tried to do it, but it failed. And it was not at all due to your behavior, your choices. Says the Talmud, the book of Kedushin, page 40a, in the middle, 
Amr of Asi, a few Chashav Adam Lasos mitzvah person tried to do mitzvah. They, they intended to do it, but something came up, something happened, an accident happened. The Almighty considered it as if they actually fulfilled it. They get the reward as if they did it. But vice versa, it doesn't work like that. You try to do a sin, but you didn't actually do it because of something else, you are spared the punishment. If you try to do a mitzvah, you invested the effort to do it, that will grant you reward. And by the way, this is an amazing difference in the reward that God distributes versus how we do it. Here, you are result you, you are rewarded for what you actually accomplished. So suppose you work really hard, but for whatever reason it fails, you're out of luck. You try to study your mathematics or your science and you write half your dissertation and for whatever reason you can't finish it, you get zero credit in this world. No one cares how much you actually tried. In Torah, the effort is rewarded. And therefore, someone can have enormous accomplishments, but they can be rewarded less than someone who has meager accomplishments, but had to work harder to achieve them. It's a true meritocracy of effort and degree of difficulty, not outcome. There's another idea here. God is fair God is precise in judgment. Now, if you look at this verse that we quoted in, in Devarim, Deuteronomy, God is righteous. God is fair in judgment. It seems like it's pretty muted praise. Oh, God's fair? Don't we have human judges that are fair too? Why is this praise that's worthy of? For God. So the commentaries tell us that in our world, we cannot do true justice. Why is that? Because there are consequences and consequences of consequences. There's the butterfly effect that you have no idea what are the ultimate consequences of your choices. And therefore, you're punishing someone. Let's say you punish someone. You imprison them. They did a crime. You imprison them. You're not just punishing them. You're punishing their colleagues, their family, their neighbors. Who knows how many people you're actually punishing? People who are completely innocent of any crime. But our judicial system cannot take that into account because we're not God. But God is fair in judgment. There is no iniquity in God's system of reward and punishment. And therefore, God will only punish someone if they are, in fact, guilty or they are deserving of that degree of punishment. And therefore, God won't punish daddy if daddy's kids are undeserving or unworthy in any way of having that done to them. So there is a controversial idea. The Chazon Ish he said that it's a bad idea to get life insurance. Now, just for the sake of full disclosure, I actually have life insurance. But listen to this idea. He says, you're put on the scale. Should this person live or should they die? So again, if it's a human court, they could only take into account the alleged offenses of the person being judged, of the defendant. But God takes everything into account. And therefore, if your kids are going to suffer because you're not around, you may be guilty, but the kids are innocent. And therefore, it's not fair to judge them, to punish them for your crimes. But what's going to be when daddy has a big fat insurance policy? Daddy is gone. But you know what? The kids are still fine. They're tended to. Well, now you are, you have removed, so to speak, one factor 
that's arguing for your exoneration, and that may in fact lead you to be more likely to expire. And therefore, says Chazanish, shouldn't get life insurance. Again, I'm not declaring this as, as a rule. As I mentioned, I do have life insurance, but at least the principle is true. If the Almighty works with such complete precision, it's completely righteous, and there's absolutely no iniquity, this actually makes a lot of sense. But again, the, the, the general idea is that the way the Almighty does it is completely different than what we were even capable of doing it. It's, it's completely honest, completely fair, completely just, and completely righteous. That's another element of divine reward and punishment. Here's another idea. The Almighty is going to have a bias towards reward over punishment. But listen to this idea. We know that the Almighty created the world because he wanted to do good. He wanted to, to be a benefactor to humans because humans could be recipients of God's goodness. The Almighty's desire, ultimate desire, is to do good. If so, why does he punish? Isn't punishment doing bad? Punishing people? So she just tell us that punishment is actually for the benefit of the individual being punished. It depends on punished like we would get revenge, to get back at someone. No. The Almighty punishes like a loving father disciplines a misbehaving child. The Almighty reprimands and admonishes out of love to help cleanse them from their flaws, to help prime them for reward. As a result, there's a difference, a fundamental difference between reward and punishment. Reward, that's the Almighty's actual desire. That's what he wants to do. That's why he created the world. Punishment, well, that's only to facilitate reward. And therefore, it's going to be a bias favoring reward over punishment. He loves his creations like a father loves their children. And therefore, reward is things working as intended. And punishment is not quite equal. It's not the desired outcome. It's like a father's reprimandation. And therefore, it's going to be less. It's going to be weaker than the than the uh, parallel punishment. Sorry, the, than, the, than the parallel reward. So here's an example of this. We already mentioned this earlier. One example is when a person tries to do a mitzvah, but for whatever reason, they weren't able to do it, they weren't able to consummate that mitzvah, they receive the reward. But they might well only punish someone if they, in fact, succeeded in actualizing their transgression. Similarly, we find the following idea. In the Talmud, the Almighty's reward outshines punishment by a factor of 500. The verse says the Almighty will extract punishment for four generations, but will extend reward for 2,000 generations. Thus, by a factor of 500, the money favors reward over punishment. And here's where it gets interesting. We don't have a concept of the amount of reward that God gives. What's the rate of reward for a mitzvah? How much is the reward for a given mitzvah? Torah doesn't reveal to us the extent of the reward that God accords those who listen to him. In fact, we're told in the Mishnah, the first Mishnah in chapter 2 of Perkyavos, you don't know the reward of a mitzvah. Nevertheless, we get some clues. And what we discover is that we have this little window, this little 
appreciation of how the Almighty gives reward, what we discover is that the reward is staggering relative to a mitzvah. So listen to this. In the book of Numbers, Bamidbar, the end of Parshas Baha'aloscha, Miriam, who is Moshe's older sister, she speaks Lashonara against Miriam. I'm sorry, against Moshe. Against Moshe. And she gets Saras, she becomes a leper. And she has to have seven days of quarantine until she can be healed from her malady. And the verse tells us that the nation did not travel. It was time for the nation to travel. They didn't travel, and they waited for her for seven days. Why did they wait seven days for Miriam? It was one old lady. It was a nation of millions of people. Why is everyone waiting for Miriam? So Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud in the book of Sota, Rashi tells us because she once waited for someone else. When Moshe, her younger brother, was a baby, the mom, Yocheved, had to improvise and place Moshe in a box in the Nile because there was a decree mandating that all babies be chucked into the water. And his sister Miriam was waiting and observing and watching to see what's going to be with Moshe. And as a reward for her waiting for Moshe, the nation waited for her. I always say that this example gives us a snapshot of the divine system of reward. How long did she wait for him? So Talmud says that she waited one hour for Moshe until you know, Pharaoh's daughter came and eventually adopted Moshe. So you have one hour that she waited for one person. One person waited for one person. And then you have seven days that a nation of millions waited for her. Moreover, you know, she waited for her brother. Who wouldn't wait for their sibling? Find out what's going to be with him. A whole nation waited for a stranger. And I always say that you know this is... Even if we were strangers, you see a mom placing a baby in a box and letting it flow on a river. I feel like I would be curious to see what's going to be the destiny of that baby. I'd watch out of sheer curiosity. That's not quite the same as waiting for the DMV, right? Nevertheless, we see how does the Almighty evaluate? She waited for one hour. A nation of millions is going to wait for seven days. That's like thousands of times, millions of times, billions of times more than what she waited. Think about it. If you have a nation of three million and she waited for one hour, how many hours are there in a day? How many hours are there in seven days? And you multiply that times how many people? We're talking about millions and billions of times more than what she did. She got out of it. A little window in how the amplification of mitzvos results in the reward for said mitzvos. Here's another example. Listen to this. One of the worst villains of her history was a man named Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He was one who destroyed the first temple, slaughtered countless Jews, took countless Jews as slaves in chains to Babylon, And he was effectively the king of the entire world. His sprawling empire essentially covered all of the known world or the civilized world at the time. Civilized is a relative term. He was the most powerful man the world had ever seen. How did he get that honor? The Talmud asked that question. How did Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, how did he get that honor? Says the Talmud, it was in the merit of the four steps that he took. What are these four steps? It says the Talmud, this is the book of Sanhedrin, page 96a. He was a secretary who worked for the previous king of Babylon, Merodach Baladan, and this other king of Babylon wanted to write a letter 
to Chizkiah, the king of the Jews, who was sick. The Talmud tells us how did he know who Chizkiah was or that he was sick. It tells us just some interesting backstory here that Chizkiah was a righteous king, but his father was a wicked king, Ahaz. And when Ahaz died, there was a miracle that the day was shortened. Why? Because he was such a wicked king, and therefore it was inappropriate to mourn him as you would mourn an ordinary king. And therefore, the Almighty shrunk the day in order that there shouldn't be enough time, or there should be so much time, to mourn this wicked king. And when the king of Babylon says, well, what happened today? Why is today such a short day? They said, well, Ahaz died. And then when Chistia was sick, King Chistia, Hezekiah, when he was sick, those extra hours that were that were removed from the day of the funeral of his father were added to the day so that there's more daylight, so that way his, his healing happens in a more expedited fashion. And therefore, the king of Babylon says, wait, what's happening now? Why is the day so much longer? They'd say to him, well, King Chistia is ill. And he says, oh, he's ill. I got to send him a letter wishing him a recovery. So who was writing that letter? Nebuchadnezzar was the scribe. And they were writing the letter, and the letter said, greetings to King Chistia. Greetings to the city of Jerusalem and greetings to the great almighty God. So it said first greetings to Chistia and only subsequently did it say greetings to the great almighty God. So Nebuchadnezzar, he says, wait a minute, something inappropriate over here. First you should praise God and only subsequently should you praise the king Chistia. So he ran out after the messengers and says, no, we got to switch it. We got to alter it. We got to alter the text of the blessing. First, you have to say greetings to God, and then you say greetings to King Christia. So, indeed, Nebuchadnezzar pursued the messenger and they revised the letter. Says the Talmud, why did Nebuchadnezzar, why did he become such a powerful king? And why did he become the king of Babylon, the king of the whole world, because he ran four paces to uphold the honor of God. Says the Talmud, had he ran even further, he would have completely destroyed the Jewish people. He would have had so much power as a reward for his upstanding of the honor of God or for standing up for the honor of God that the Jewish people would have been completely destroyed. His power would not have been curtailed at all. Says the Talmud, imagine the reward of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nebuchadnezzar was rewarded in this world because he ran four paces for the honor of God. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they ran their whole lives like tireless horses to uphold and to stand up for the honor of God. Imagine their reward. Says Rashi, you will be astonished at the reward. If this is what an evil person, King Nebuchadnezzar has for four paces, that's it, four steps that he took for the honor of God, he was given so much reward in this world. Imagine the reward for Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. I think this is a valuable idea. The reward is not equal to the effort expended. It's amplified by factors of millions. None of us would say that the deserving reward for four paces, when someone watched four paces for God's honor, that that should result in the honor and distinction and stature of Nuhanetzar. We wouldn't say that, but that's how God works. And we have no idea the reward that Amos and Jacob are getting or are destined to get in the afterlife, we have no idea. Our eye cannot see that. But this gives us just a picture of the rate of reward that the Almighty dispenses. The, in God's eyes, the deserving reward for walking four steps for God is the equivalent of becoming someone as powerful 
as Nebuchadnezzar. He's not going to get any reward in the afterlife, and therefore it's all given to him here. And this makes sense. And this idea, I think, explains why... And this idea explains why our sages always remind us to keep in the back of our minds the concept of reward and punishment so that way we don't sin in this world. Look at three things. Visualize three things and you will not sin, says the Mishnah in the beginning of the second chapter of Pergabos. No, what's above you? A seeing eye, a listening ear, and all your deeds are inscribed in a book. The first Mishnah of the third chapter of Perkei Avos tells us, look at three things and you won't sin. Know before whom you are destined to give an accounting and a reckoning before God. So again, this idea of war and punishment is very helpful for us to help us construct our life and the priorities that we have and the choices that we make and the agenda that we set for ourselves in this world because we know that there is boundless reward that's designated for those who adhere to God. And of course, the flip side, the punishment for violation of the will of God is equally draconian and intense. And again, I want to point out, this is still an introduction to the subject of reward and punishment. We're trying to get more of an understanding into the nature of the, of the divine method of reward and punishment. And we learned that God is completely fair. Nothing is overlooked. Nothing is immaterial. Nothing's insignificant. The ultimate reward and punishment is an omaba. The tzaddik ends up with ultimate reward. The wicked one ends up with ultimate punishment. And, inci and incidentals are addressed over here. Not all mitzvahs are created equal. And the thing that determines the degree of reward is how difficult it was for a person to do that, and everything is individualized. You get rewarded for your effort. How hard was it? How much did you have to expend? Even if that does not necessarily translate to results. And then we looked about a bias towards reward over punishment. That is what the money is, in fact, desirous of. There's a factor of 500 more reward over punishment, and we saw a few examples of the staggering rate of reward relative to a person's input and it's good advice to remember that we will face judgment that will help us make sure that we live a righteous life and an exceptional life of course there's still so much to cover we're going to talk about the gehenna i'm really excited for that i read some crazy stuff recently i'm excited to share that all about what's all about what do we know about it what is beyond us what happens after you die? Reincarnation. I'm really excited about all these subjects coming up in our Torah 101 series. Until then, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.